G'day everyone, it's Warren Davies, the Unbreakable Farmer, and welcome to On The Wire. And today, on episode six, I think it is, we've got Tori Truitt, who's better known as the health bloke. Tori's an exercise physiologist, a motivational speaker, and a corporate health coach. Welcome, Tori, and thanks for your time, mate. Thanks for having me, Warren. Look forward to it. I've been, uh, I've been watching the first five episodes, uh, so let's hope I can do it justice. No, you, I'm sure you will, mate. So I suppose we'll just start off and get straight into it. Um, if you'd like to, to give um, everyone out there just a little bit of a, a background of, 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 of Tory Truitt and, and how the health bloke come about. Yeah, sure, Warren. I guess growing up, uh, probably like plenty of other uh, young, uh, young Australian males, I, I was always uh, aspiring to be an AFL footballer. Um, but for one reason or another, whether it be too short, too slow, and not good enough, I, I never quite got there. Um, but uh, I went through school as being the jock, not particularly a great student, because I, I thought I uh, had these aspirations that I was going to play for the Hawks, but uh, that didn't come about. But my, my dad once said to me, he said, Tori, I don't care what you do, but whatever you do, be self-employed. Um, and at the time, I just sort of took that for granted. But Looking back on it, having been self-employed for 16 years, it was, it was pretty sound advice. So uh, no. uh, I, um, I, did, I went through school, went through um, year 12, got my year 12 results, and then did the university course. Um, and I chose the university course that, I, that suited my strengths, and uh, that was human movement. So it was just like doing uh, PE classes for three years. Yep. Unfortunately, I came out of uh, human movement, got the age, Peeled through the employment section to look for human movement uh, graduates, and there was nothing. So uh, I then had to go back to the drawing boards, and I did a grad dip in exercise for rehabilitation. So um, did a lot of rehab work with TAC patients, hip replacements, uh, neuro, um, as well, which is really interesting. Um, and that was that was one year full time. And at the same time that I was doing that, I had a scholarship at the Institute of Sport as well. So I was sort of combining working with athletes and working with those that were particularly injured as well, which sort of gave me a clear understanding of the direction that I wanted to take um, going forward. And then again, after that, I thought, you know, I still wasn't 100% positive on what I wanted to do career-wise. So I packed my backpack and headed over to Europe and travelled for about eight months, ran out of money in Spain and then hightailed it to London. Um, and at that stage, that was in, in the late 90s. Most of my mates were earning really good money um, as stockbrokers, being the exercise physiologist, the pound didn't pay that well. Yeah, got a job um, working for Bupa um, as an ex-phys, and before and after work, I started PTing or personal training just to get a bit more money. Um, that's that's the health insurance company, Bupa. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. So obviously, that was in '97 that I, I got the job there in London, and I was with them for two and a half years. So, and at that stage, they hadn't hit, hit Australia, but they're, they're well and truly entrenched in. Um, in Australia now. So I worked for them as an exercise physiologist, but also started personal training, um, subcontracting for three gyms in London. Um, and that's where I started True Health. And True Health uh, is just a play on word. My surname's Truett, so we used, you know, True Health. Um, and True Health personal training started in 1999 in London. Oh. So that was pretty exciting. It was going pretty well. And then I had to decide on whether I wanted to stay in London um, or come back come back to Australia, come back to Melbourne, which is where I was sort of born and bred. So I guess, obviously, I, I chose to come back to Melbourne in 2001. And in February 2001, um, True Health Personal Training uh, was launched. And that was launched out of the back of a Ford Transit van, $20,000 uh, $20, loan from uh, the Commonwealth Bank. And I, I went around and, and drove around and served a sort of uh, metropolitan Melbourne um, as, as a personal trainer. Yeah. So just doing like um, park type of stuff or out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, as I said, 2001. There wasn't many of us around, but I was 100% mobile. Um, and then I got bigger, bigger and bigger or busier and busier. And the only way I could earn more money was put some, some people on. So I ended up putting another van on. We had two vans on the road. Um, and then I got my first corporate contract uh, about six months in um, to, the, to the job. And that corporate contact uh, contract I've still got today. So at that stage, the business only had 250 employees um, in, in an office in Abbotsford. They've now got 1,200 employees and about 33,000 globally. And I, I've been looking after them um, for that period of time. 
So explain, um, explain like that that corporate health coaching. What what's what's that entail? Like, what do you do there? Yeah, it, it's it's a really good question, Warren, and and I guess depending upon. six hours a day, um, you know, manning gyms or, or doing health assessments or seminars, educational seminars. Um, and one of our biggest contracts, probably seven years ago, we got into the mining industry. So we travel up the east coast of Australia and look after the, the, the mining fraternity. Yep. But I guess when I initially started corporate health, um, so to speak, it was always looking at the physical conditioning component. Yep. But when you go in and you preach about physical fitness, you only attract a, a small percentage of your audience. So I broadened the, um, the term or, or broadened my service offerings and now we look around the whole dimensions of wellness. So I look after you know, financial fitness, emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, physical wellness, nutritional, nutritional wellness as well. So we really try and encapsulate something for everyone in the employee, uh, employee setting. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're looking after the whole package and not just focusing on that small, as you said. I could imagine, it, especially in the mining industry, that you wouldn't have too many um, people that, you know, that like they, the fitness side of it is probably not one of the big things. Yeah, and I guess we'll talk about it later on, Warren. And I reckon I've found that people that are uh, emotionally unhappy, the last thing they want to do is fitness. People that are financially strapped, the last thing they want to do is afford a gym membership. So... There tends to be a cross pollination between different dimensions of wellness, and that might be social, particularly in the mining industry. There's people that are um, not very socially fit in terms of they've relocated their whole family, or they might just be FIFOs and fly in and fly out themselves, and they don't have a core group of mates that they can get to, or you know, really leverage a friendship off. So, so they're pretty lonely. They don't join the local footy club or hockey club or soccer club. So, if people are feeling um, down about themselves or their self-confidence is poor or whatever, the last thing, as you say, uh, do they feel like is eating healthy food and going for a run after work. Because yeah, they're there probably for one reason and that's to make money and, and to work, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, correct. Correct, yeah. Um, and, you know, I've seen people from all, all kinds of life that, and I guess you've seen it too, Warren, this whole corporate lifestyle, uh, it's pretty easy for people to get caught up in, you know, chasing the dollar or, or the ego or the job title, um, but their underlying purpose or their under, underlying happiness doesn't really reflect um, their output. Yeah. So I suppose we've touched on it and that was one of the main reasons, apart from catching up and having a chat as well, but one of the main reasons I've got you on is to, to talk about that, that link between um, physical fitness and, and mental health and, and obviously that's something that you work with in that mining industry but across the board I think it's a, it's an important thing that you know if people aren't moving or getting physically like active it, it does um, play a, a big part in their mental health as well. Yeah, spot on, Warren. And I think, and you know, I'm pretty biased because I've always loved fitness and it's always become part of my lifestyle so I find it hard to preach to people that don't do any and try and really encourage them to, to do some exercise. But I find that there is, um, I call it the unhappy triad, and that's, you know, someone that doesn't exercise and nutrition is poor and then they're, they're obviously emotional wellness is poor. And I think there's a really um, close link between all three. And I think if you can do something rather than doing nothing, then that's a start. I know, you know, the national guidelines for exercise is 30 minutes a day, seven days a week. And I think that's, you know, again, putting too much pressure on the person. But what's the formula that's going to work for Warren? What's the formula that's going to work for Tori? And I think it's establishing some individual guidelines rather than comparing yourself with other people or your mates or what you read in magazines or see on the internet. Comparing yourself, okay, this is where I'm currently at and project where you want to get to and then how you're going to get there. And I guess that's where I... Uh, I see myself as, as being an asset for someone that's looking for a little bit of um, accountability or some guidance and same with the staff that work for me because the positive effects on exercise are huge. I mean, first and foremost, I guess it's, it's the, the feel-good chemical that comes with it um, and it is, you know, it's getting the release of your nat natural endorphins um, 
and how, how you get them and, and when they kick in, it's just a matter of doing something consistently on a regular basis. And then obviously if you start exercising, then that positive self-esteem, you start feeling better about yourself, you start looking a little bit better, like there's quite a, a snowball effect that happens from, uh, from that. And it, uh, I guess to an extent it does distract you from your worries as well, Warren. Yeah, well, and it's interesting you say that because I heard on, I must have been on the radio on the ABC or something the other day. They were talking about the correlation between professional sportsmen, especially like an AFL or rugby league players, that are on that consistent exercise program all the time. Like that's their job. Basically, yeah. when, that, when that career comes to an end, they're at a loose end, and and, and I suppose they, they're not getting that that, that consistency and and that adrenaline release or whatever it all the endorphin release and then yeah. they spiral a bit out of control if they don't find something else to take its place yeah absolutely and i think there's a, there's a lot of correlations between um exercise and mental health um and then also I often talk to a lot of corporates about chronic disease and and you know these lifestyle diseases which are becoming more prevalent um, and for me as an educator, it's really frustrating because I think we've got more access to information and education. Yet there's more incidents of diabetes, suicide, high blood pressure and obesity. Um, but the recent stats show that 75% of deaths from people that have mental health actually come from lifestyle diseases. So it's you know, because they're inactive or because they're not eating well or because they're overweight, not actually because of, of suicide, so to speak. But I think that's where a, a person like yourself plays a part because, as you said, the access, we're in a, um, a world of, over, of information overload and, and you, where, which do you pick? Like, you, as you said, you look at the magazines and you look at this and, and which is the right path for you and that's where someone like yourself plays that part to be able to put you on the right course. Otherwise, you're just trying a bit of this and trying a bit of that and it doesn't work. It's not... Not yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's even my industry too, um, Warren, to an extent, it, it's really hard to gain some credibility. I mean, it's personal training and I, I've never liked the term. And um, when I first started my business, I said all my trainers had to be university qualified and let's call ourselves health coaches rather than personal trainers to, to get ourselves away from those that just do a six-week course and think they're an expert and they're charging more than you. Um, but I guess, as you say, there's so much... Uh, miscommunication or misinformation in the media in terms of all these fads that hit the marketplace and there might be a shake, there might be a diet, there'll be no carbs, low carbs, high carbs. Um, and people, as you say, they're just confused. And oh, if, if anything, if, if there's one piece of advice that I give to all my clients, whether you're a professional athlete, a corporate exec or, or just Joe, Joe Normal like myself, it's just everything in moderation. You know, have a glass of wine, have a couple of beers and a pie and sauce of the footy, but just don't do, you know, just don't overindulge in anything you do. And that goes for exercise. I don't think it's you know, ha healthy to be an exercise addict. There's plenty of people that, you know, for them, that is their medication, you know, exercising is their medication, but they might go too far. So it really is um, trying to find a, a happy medium, mate, and just a balance. Yeah, so... With that, the advice, what would you give the advice to give someone that isn't doing anything at the moment and, and, and probably, like you said, that triangle and everything's out of kilter, where's yeah. a good place to start? Like, yeah, and, and again, every, every case is different, but I'll say to all of my clients, I said, you've got to start running your body like a small business, you know, and you know, if I was to start a small business, I'd be constantly looking at my P&Ls, you know, my profit and loss, profit and loss. And for you as an individual, you've got to look at your positives. You know, what's the positive for Warren, you know, and what are your negatives? You know, your, neg your positives might be, oh, you know, you're strong, you, you know, you've got a good engine, you're not afraid of working hard. Your negatives might be, oh, your knees are shot, your hips are shot, or your back sore, you know, or, or you've got no intrinsic motivation. How can you do it? And then it's just baby steps, baby steps. And I guess... I devised a formula, um, as I said at the start, I was never a great student. So when I came out in the corporate, I thought, how can I instill a formula um, for my, uh, my, um, my business? And basically one of my mottos is whatever you do, be better than average. You know, so if the national standards are 30 minutes a day, seven days a week, seven days a week, I say to my corporate execs or, or whatever, I said, instead of giving me seven days a week, give me four out of seven. Yeah. That's better than average. Instead of giving me 30 minutes out of an hour, give me 45 minutes out of an hour. Yeah. 
Yeah. Instead of giving me 52 weeks a year, give me 45 weeks a year. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, as cliche as it sounds, health and fitness, whether it be nutrition, exercise, uh, spirituality, emotion, whatever it might be, consistency is the key across the board. You know, you've just got to be consistent. So I guess a lot of people go on these, these diets, it's not sustainable. A lot of people go on these exercise kits, uh, kicks, because they want to get fit for a holiday or a wedding or an event or something, yeah, yeah. and it's not sustainable. So you just got to do whatever fits into your lifestyle, Warren, do that, and I'll do whatever fits into my lifestyle. But I'm by no means anal with what I eat. Like I'm conscious of what I eat, and I think you know the awareness of being conscious of good food um, and understanding you know what is good food and what is bad food. And, and again, there's there's a lot in the media about that, but. The uh, the less time you can sp- spend inside the aisles of the supermarket, the better. Shop around the outsides, go to the fruit and veg. Um, the less things out of a packet's always better. And probably a number one thing that most of us get wrong is we actually don't drink enough water. Yeah, yeah. I, it's I, just, I, just simple things that you've just got to do. I like that one because when I've heard you speak before, I've heard you say that one shop around the outside of the supermarket, not down the aisles. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, there's not much, not much value down the aisles, man, unless you're getting some, uh, some shaving cream and some, uh, some deodorant. Yeah, no, that's, um, yeah, it's all in boxes and it's all just crap, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, and, and when you look at mental health and nutrition, I guess a lot of the time, a lot of eat for comfort food or, or you're stressed and you're over and you're dulled. You might have a few too many beers or you might grab a tub of ice cream and then that's a snowball effect too because then you start beating yourself up and your confidence goes down, your self-esteem goes down and then the alarm goes off in the morning, you say, I've got to go to the gym, you don't feel like doing that because you're lethargic or, or you're in a sugar coma or whatever you're in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and I know that does play a part and you, and that guilt thing kicks in and then your mental health just spirals and, and yeah. you one again. So, yeah, you have to. Yeah, and, and it's a really tough one. But, you know, for, for those that are really struggling, um, you know, with that intrinsic motivation, they, they've just got to try. Uh, and as I said, run your body like a small business. But any small business have a really good team around them too. So I encourage people um, to get a good team, whether it be a spouse, a friend, you know, a personal trainer or someone um, to help guide you. And I only heard this weekend, mate, that um, I think it was Ferrari or Red Bull or whatever. Yeah. They have uh, a team of mechanics, 750 mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that's a serious team. Like, I'm not suggesting that we need that, but I think we need a number of people to support us across a number of areas of our life, you know, not just in the gym or not just at work or not just at home. You need a, you know, a really good team that supports you in terms of your goals and ambitions and things that you want to achieve going forward. And I think that's, that's with anything in life, even with, with, our, with like both of us with our speaking and, and having that team around you that understands what you're, where you're heading and what you're wanting to achieve and, and, and the sacrifices that you might have to make along the way just to get there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and you look at the best sports person in the world, they'll have a coach, they'll have a masseuse, they'll have you know, a psychologist, they'll have a, yeah, have a nutritionalist. The top corporate exec or the CEO, they'll have you know a CFO, a COO. You know they've got a, they do have a number of people around them um, to support them as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's correct. And I think you know on the on an individual level, we're either too proud that we want to don't want to seek help, or you don't want to seek advice, or you're embarrassed, or you don't know where to start. Um, or you think you can do it all yourself. And I think the sooner we can say, okay, listen, why not I need a hand with this? Can you help me with this? And, and then vice versa, uh, then collectively I think we'll be, be better off. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Basically, so most of the time if you're in that position where you're trying to start out with something, that you're not going to have the knowledge or the skills to be able, otherwise you'd be doing it already. So you need, yeah, to, you need to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately, like any, any you do have to filter out, um, you know, the riffraff. In, in terms of, you know, the, the stuff that you read in the paper, you see on the telly and all that sort of stuff. And, and probably an, another thing I'd suggest you do is not watch the, too much um, midday TV. I know you would be doing that, mate, but there's always a vibration plate or something you can, uh, you know, that's going to make you lose 10 kilos in two days. And, they, you know. Yeah, they crack me up. Um, yeah, no, and like, especially like in my background as a farmer, like nothing like hard work. Like that's, that's, that's yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, across the board, you know, absolutely. And whether that's in the gym or whether you're going walking or you're actually working, you know, obviously I don't, 
reckon that working hard, really hard back, it will kill you as well if you work too hard. But it's the same thing. It's all in moderation and and yeah, um, it all, absolutely. It's all the same principle. So I suppose we'll, we'll wrap it up shortly, mate. So I just thought I'd ask you a couple of questions, and and one of them, which I've asked most of the guests, is what advice would you give to a younger Tory Truett that from the knowledge that you've got now, what advice would you give a young Tory, say when you were early teenagers or mid teens, what advice would you give Tory? Uh, find a mentor or a role model. Yeah. And copy the positive things that they've done to become successful. Yeah. And would you just and when in saying that, would you just pick one role model or a number of ones and try and pick their positive traits? Yeah, I reckon probably a couple of them, absolutely. Yeah, from a couple of different areas. And, you know, if you were to think about, you know, who are you going to have, you know, at, at, your, at your dinner party or whatever like that, it might be a Richard Branson, it might be an Alan Musk, it might be, a, you know, someone in the sporting industry or whatever. I think everyone's got um, a couple of, you know, good positive traits that we could all learn from. And, um, you know, Obviously, I use my father or my dad as as my uh, my mentor going forward. But I, but I wish I had a stuck closer to people that were successful in my industry. I mean, my dad was self employed, and, and I guess that's why he encouraged me to be self employed. But he was an accountant. He was a number cr- number cruncher yep. and didn't really understand the health space. So if I had have had some guidance from someone in that health space, yep. um, and and learned off them. I mean, I've made some mistakes, which I'm cool with. But I often think that maybe in terms of where I am currently, I might be five years further advanced if I had of um, really embraced some, some leadership or, or a role model or a mentor. And obviously both, but input from both of those mentors would have combined well and, and as you said, catapulted you probably and increased your, where you are at the moment. You'd be, as you said, five years down the track. Yeah, because you know what it's like, mate. You, you've been there and, and you're doing it now. Being self-employed is pretty lonely. Um, you know, it's it's got its positives and negatives. But when I was first starting out, you know, it was just a grind. You know, it was it was grinding, it was grinding, it was grinding every day. It was hard to see daylight, and your mates were getting uh, paid a wage, and you know, yeah. doing things that you couldn't afford to do. Um, and at some stage, that you know, it, it, it still does frustrate me. Um, but I guess the upside of being self-employed and, and you know, the sense of pride and enjoyment you get out of that is, is probably greater at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. And one more last question. So three words that would sum up what we've just talked about t- today. What would the three words would come to your mind? Make health a habit. Four words. Oh, that'll do. I'll, I, won't hold, I won't pull you up on that. Make yeah, I, I just think, mate, and, and I see it all the time in the corporate world, not enough people value health, and you know, and I'm not talking having a six pack. I'm not talking being able to run a marathon. I'm just talking about mental clarity. I'm talking about happiness. I'm talking about positive self esteem, self confidence, motivation. I'm talking all of that sort of stuff. Um, well, people say when when you're healthy, oh, you know. But I guess we get caught up in in society. I guess we get caught up in you know chasing the dollar or, or chasing a job title or whatever it might be. Um, and then 10 or 15 years later, you get, to, you know, I wish I had of, you know, done some exercise or didn't do this, you know, and it's, it could be all too late. Yeah, that's, that's right. It could be. And that's, and that's the unfortunate part. Well, mate, thank you very much for being on, on The Wire. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having, having you on and it's, it's been good to have a chat with you. It's been too long and, yeah, it's an um, absolute pleasure having you on and thanks for your words of wisdom and, um, yeah, Look forward to catching up with you soon. Thoroughly enjoyed it, mate, and all the best. I'll continue to watch. Good on you, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Ros. See you, mate.